uh, the newly released draft permanent uh, regulations um, that are currently in a 15-day comment period. So to start, just so I understand, um, how many people here are uh, retailers, are in the retail space? All right. And how many are distributors? Any distributors? Great. Uh, good. Um, uh, cultivators in the room? Thank you. Uh, any testing labs here today? Okay, good. Um, uh, let's see, manufacturers, people manufacturing. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, and then I know we have some POS companies, some people who work for advertising and branding firms. Um, and then my compliance nerds in the back. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, I will admit, uh, what I'd like to preface by saying one, that this isn't everything that's in the regs. Uh, in the newly released draft, it kind of is to help maybe focus your attention on certain areas. Obviously, there's some big hot button issues that everybody's uh, talking about. And then there's also some more granular, interesting little tidbits that they put in there that also have um, consequences. So part of this is we're just gonna talk through some of those changes, highlighting those changes, the possible impacts, and hopefully um, give you some, some fuel or inspiration to draft some uh, meaningful public comment in this very short period of time we have. How many of you guys commented on the last set of regulations, actually submitted comments? Okay, so the interesting thing, uh, on Friday, October 19th, these revised regulations were released. We have until Monday, November 5th at 5 p.m. to submit comments. So that's 12 more days from today. Um, a special note for this round of comments is that only comments addressing the newly proposed changes are accepted. So you can't go back and still comment on the old things that didn't change. So you really want to identify when you're looking at this new language where a change happened because that's your that's your crack to get in there and insert public comment on those aspects. So you can comment on the newly proposed revisions and you can also comment on the new documents and forms and other things that are glorious that they've introduced. So um, in order to not have this just be a completely depressing experience, um, I tried to start with some uh, positive aspects that I gleaned from some of the changes that were good, that were good wins that we had. Um, one of the biggest ones I think for the industry is going to be that they've changed the sequence of labeling so that distribution can now label the cannabinoid content, THC, CBD, after, um, after final product. So a manufacturer can submit their packaged labeled product with everything except that cannabinoid content to a distributor and after receiving that certificate of analysis, then they can put on the THC, CBD. If you've been seeing the headlines that one in five products is failing in California, everything's poison, oh my God, 65% of those fails is because of label claims, is because the THC CBD is not coming within that 10% threshold. And so now we would hope that about 65% of those remediation efforts will be eliminated and people will just be able to label it after they get that um, final test result. Another big one is that the BCC and the Department of Public Health have agreed upon uh, tinctures being a thing and being allowed to be part of the industry. So they've changed the rules around the alcohol content for tinctures. So this is now an allowable product category and they're actually in agreement, which is fantastic when that happens. Um, thanks to SB 311, we now have distributor distributor transfers that are possible. So the test results hold and you can uh, distribute a tested pro uh, product and transfer that between multiple distributors so you don't have to test it with every single distributor that you happen to be working with. Great win. There's expanded events locations thanks to AB 2020. So now it doesn't only have to be on a fairground with local authorization. We have pathways to have more um, public events for retail and consumption. We can now reject partial shipments. This was like, you know, maybe not a very exciting one, but it was pretty great <laughs> because they had it before that either you had to accept the whole shipment or reject it if something was wrong with it. So now if you get a shipment and some of the product is damaged, you cannot accept it. If you get a shipment and part of it is not labeled correctly, you cannot accept that part of the shipment. And as a retailer, you can take in the rest of it. That'll help the supply chain a little bit. 
there's now uh, edibles can be uh, remediated through repackaging. So if you put in your batch of, you know, blueberry chocolates and it hits over the limit, you can actually repackage it so that you can put as many would actually meet the requirement instead of having to destroy that. That's pretty great. There's some higher action levels for the category two solvents. So it kind of gives a little more uh, wiggle room there in the testing things. And there's lots of new forms. We love forms. It's great. Uh, the BCC has all of these instructions that they give on um, notifying them about this and notifying about that, but they never really gave much methodology to notifying other than like send an email to info at BCC and maybe somebody will see it. And a lot of these forms have to do with like the licensing procedures because yeah. they probably saw a whole gambit of quality and, and presentation and form. So in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's really good that they're systematizing it. it. It should be a lot easier going forward. There's going to be a lot more clarity. And even with the CEQA issue, um, it, it's provided, Los Angeles was a morass with CEQA because mm -hmm. the process in LA has been so slow. They've now laid out clearly what everyone's expected to give with respect to CEQA. And those uh, forms, like I mentioned in the beginning, are part of the material that you can comment upon. So if you, I'm not covering the contents of those forms in this presentation, uh, but you would want to look at the content of those forms and if there's aspects of it that merit a comment, you will want to do that. So, and the greatest thing maybe is more clarity. I don't know. Some, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But now we'll talk about the other things, <laughs> the, the other things in there. So um, one of the biggest pieces that came down is this expanded definition of ownership. Surprise! You may be an owner of a cannabis company and not know it. Um, the language that was added in one section is that any individual entitled to a share of at least 20% of the profits uh, may be considered an owner. And, and or is, is an owner. This is important because a lot of folks were using passive involvement mm -hmm. to... Um, claim that they weren't owners and so this is really going to affect a lot of the large management groups out there who are managing multiple retail chains if a particular jurisdiction has a cap on ownership per city. In many cases I have included uh, the statement of reason that came from the BCC sometimes just because it's funny like some of their statements of reasons is one step up for them because we said so um, so and or lots of times it's just like this is just additional clarity that's ruining your life it's fine um, so so some of those you'll see I included like what was their reasoning in cases that they did it so ex extending upon that this is where it starts to get really interesting in that designation of owner so they put in this term, any individual who assumes responsibility for the license. So this can be somebody who's managing or directing the business in exchange for a share of the profits. It can be somebody who assumes responsibility for debts. It can be an individual who is determining how a portion of the cannabis business is run, including non-plant touching portions of the commercial cannabis business, such as branding and marketing. That's interesting. <laughs> That's an overreach. We'll see. Um, and then also an individual who's determining what cannabis goods the commercial cannabis business will cultivate, manufacture, distribute, purchase, or sell. So this is, um, this is where it gets interesting in a lot of the discussions that are happening because that can theoretically incorporate a lot of people. And there seems to be a discretionary aspect of it as well. So when um, it keeps going, like when it's an entity, uh, they want to get down to, I, I want to have a t-shirt made that just says, until only individuals remain, um, which is going to be my new motto for the cannabis industry itself. Just say, can we just take it back to individuals? And, and anyone who's been going through the licensing, licensing process has probably experienced that. We've had a couple of projects where we've had to go up six or seven levels of corporate entities until they get to the warm bodies. It's, it's Las Vegas casino style regulations they ultimately want to know who's going to be profiting with these businesses. Where's the money going? And that's along with the expansion of the definition of ownership came the expansion of a definition of financial interest holders. Some of these were super surprising, you know, that they go down to receiving a portion of the profits is employees who are doing a profit share with their own company, landlords who have entered into lease agreements who are taking a piece of your company, consultants who have taken a piece of your company, <laughs> attorneys and, and uh, accountants who have taken a piece of your company, 
part of this to me is super exciting because we're going to see all of these interesting companies that have been taking a piece of a lot of people's companies and they're going to have to be disclosed as financial interest holders. And that shouldn't be surprising at all because that's the guidance the state's been giving over the last nine months when disclosing these financial interests. You know, unambiguously, they've gave us advice in writing over the phone that, you know, if anyone's getting a percentage of the revenue, if anyone's getting percentage of the profits, if anytime there's percentage based compensation, that's like the red flag triggering that you're financially interested, state wants to know who you are. As a financially interested party, you're not getting live scan, but the state wants to know who's profiting from these things. Absolutely. And even if even a salesperson who's making a commission on sales is considered a financially interested party. And if that commission you're getting or that portion of the business exceeds that 20% threshold back to surprise you're an owner because you're now profiting more than 20 percent based on your business so conflating those two uh when an institute has that financial business the 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 bureau is going to decide in some cases they may decide that you do fall under the owner th their, the, their definition of owner so while there's different requirements as aaron was saying of the disclosures you have to do in terms of live scans and whatnot as an owner and just being listed with your information and identifying features as a financial interest holder it's possible in disclosing those financially interested parties that the bureau is going to receive review it and say actually that person is an owner and and shift that and the same thing with the financially interested parties they want to get down there to the flesh and blood person until only individuals remain it's, you can't be an entity they want to know every person involved with that entity no matter how many layers the entity goes back and and just with anything throughout these licensing process you know failing to disclose or having the appearance that you're trying to hide something that's usually going to be worse than what you don't want to disclose if they think you're intentionally trying to deceive them. And, and that understanding of seeing that interest that they have in who, where, who's, where's the money coming from, who is involved, who are the parties, I believe has a lot to do with the second area of white hot panic, which is this white labeling issue that has come up, which is the, the, the sentence, all commercial cannabis activities shall be conducted between licensees. And that in the extension of this, they get a lot more detailed on that you're not going to be conducting commercial cannabis activities on behalf of, at the request of, or with a contract with anybody who is not licensed under this act. So this obviously brought a lot of fear up for people because a lot of people's models are based on white labeling relationships with non-licensed entities and brands that there's many reasons for this. I, um, some of the issue that we see is what, and this will kind of thread throughout, is that you have the industry, in my opinion, is responding to large and sometimes egregious operators um, who are operating unlicensed under the protection of saying I'm a non-plant touching brand therefore I don't have to tell you who I am I don't have to get a license and I don't have to be held to your advertising regulations so in a lot of these cases it seems like an action on the bureau's part to be like nope you want to be a cannabis brand you have to play by the rules of regulated cannabis and this is something we've seen a lot of from the beginning there's been a lot of celebrities who want to attach themselves to cannabis, cannabis brands and, and the overarching guidance from the state, and again, I'm, I'm not shocked by seeing it in policy now, is that they don't want unlicensed people engaging in commercial cannabis activity. They don't want licensees going beyond the scope of their license in commercial cannabis activity. So they're really trying to rein in this action. So, you know, I spent the last two days in Anaheim with a lot of smart people who were all, you know, discussing solutions for this uh, issue. Obviously, this is, a, it's, this is an area that desperately needs some comment because I think in trying to um, take out one piece of it, obviously, it's, it's compromising the way that a lot of smaller businesses are functioning in the space. So what we need to offer here, and this goes into how you craft a comment, is a meaningful comment is the only thing that the agencies have to respond to. So if you just say, hey, you're ruining my life and why don't we just deregulate everything, that wouldn't be considered a meaningful comment. You have to actually cite a specific uh, section, the specific regulation, say, state what the problem is, and offer a solution. 
So luckily, there's lots of smart people working on that, but don't necessarily depend on them to do it. You should submit your own comments. There's been everything suggested from maybe they should invent a new license type that would cover brands and IP and, and non-plant touching aspects with 15 days and them up against the line of expiring emergency regs are, you know, chances of that happening are slim. Or um, as, as some eloquent people thought, it might be as simple as the addition of some language saying that uh, all of this is, you know, this is fine and good, except in the cases in which the person is a financial interest holder, so that you could extend that um, uh, information in terms of who is the person benefiting from this and that they want their name attached to it, their information. There's an interesting model in ABC Liquor <laughs> um, that, that could be a possible solution as well, which is AB 893 in 2015, uh, sponsored by the California Craft Brewers Association, created this thing called a beer brand registration. So a beer brand registration was a document that a brand would send, even if they were contract manufacturing, to say, hey, we're a brand, here's our information, here's, here's what we want to do. We can only dream of the day as cannabis people that you could get something as sweet as this when you read what it is in the business and professions code that all they have to do is register the band the brand with the department upon filing of the registration you can be sold without any further action from the department you don't even have to wait for them to say it's okay you just send in the letter and it's fine there you go, go for it that, that would be great so i mean and this is an example so there are examples from of the alcohol industry of uh, even for the brokerage issue because some of that stuff of financial interest holder and unlicensed parties um, goes into that broker model of, of the middleman who is arranging deals and making that problematic and in the wine industry you have a wine broker license which is you register they have your information you're listed with the state I'm a wine broker it's interesting to look at um, Nevada's model where Nevada has the agent card. Anybody who's participating in any way in the cannabis industry has an agent card. They get live scan, their information's there. And it seems like this might be something that would satisfy the state's interest in knowing who are the players, what is your name, where do you live, <laughs> you know, where is the money and going? where is the money? Like, where is it coming from and where is it going? So those are, those are some of the existing models we have to point to to say, hey, is that simple? And something like that could be, something like beer brand registration could be easier than the creation of a license type, which is, causes them panic and fear, or um, you know, something that may not satisfy their needs of the information disclosure that they're after. So um, another big topic was the technology platform regulations. So I mean, in short form, we can see what happened is that some unlicensed operators, advertisers, tech platforms were, you know, doing very, very large scale businesses benefiting from the commercial cannabis industry and sometimes the non-commercial cannabis industry and, and claiming that because they were not a licensee, they were outside of the domain of the regulated sphere. So it seems that the Bureau has come with a very specific smackdown for some of those business models. So this piece of regulating technology platforms was another, with an, was another big one. This was their <laughs> statement of reasons, was that the Bureau has found that a number of Bureau licensees engage in delivery services that are facilitated by technology platforms. However, use of such platforms has created confusion in customers as to whether a Bureau licensee is conducting the commercial cannabis activity. Um, so moreover, some technology platforms may create the impression that they hold a Bureau license. And so to clarify this and avoid this confusion, uh, the Bureau decided to throw down this section, 5415.1, um, shall go down in infamy, uh, that a licensed retailer or microbusiness can't sell or transfer goods through the use of an unlicensed third party, intermediary business, broker, or any other business entity. So bye bye. that's, you know, clarifying. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, unless, unless, you know, there unless. are things you can use a platform, you can use technology. We're not having to be stone age and go off the internet, but the number one is clear. The licensed retailer, licensed micro business does not allow for the delivery of cannabis goods by the platform in the delivery regulations, delivery, they already. have to be employees of the licensee. That was pretty clear. So that one, you know, we got that. 
This is a nice one. The licensed retailer or licensed micro business does not share in the profits of the sale of cannabis goods with the technology platform service or provider or otherwise provide for a percentage or portion of those cannabis goods sales. And, and this shouldn't be surprising to the extent we're still recognizing medical cannabis because a lot of these um, commission-based uh, lead generation contracts in the medical community are just wholly illegal with other health care providers. It, it should be, uh, you know, in, in the healthcare context, it's all done on like flat fee, fair market value arrangement, not based on like per capita or percentage of the sale. And we saw a similar thing in the events language when they did the event, that no event coordinator can make a profit of the sales off of their business. So it's kind of kind of trying to create these clear contracts where there's a fee to use it that's the same for everybody and not that there's these individual profit sharing agreements. This one is fun as well. Number three, so the licensed retailer can, uh, microbusiness can't advertise or market cannabis goods in conjunction with the technology platform service provider outside of the technology platform and shall ensure that the platform service doesn't use their license number to advertise uh, on any advertising or marketing that primarily promotes the services of the technology platform. So when you're driving around and you see an ad just for a technology platform with no licensee attached or with a license number attached that does not belong to that, that delivery platform, this is what they're calling out and is, and is problematic, that the, the delivery platform cannot be the predominant thing advertised over the actual licensed retailer who owns the, the license number. So that is going to throw a wrench in a lot of the billboards all over California. We'll see. Um, these, these, ones, uh, this one is uh, nice as well, that the licensed retailer microbiz has to ensure that the following information is provided to the consumers, that the product advertised for sale discloses at a minimum the licensed retailers or microbusinesses business name and license number. So when you're on said platform, and you're just buying products and you have no idea which store it's actually coming from, what the state is saying is that that retailer, the actual retailer with a license number supplying that product has to be visible. Um, this one, this 4A is important because this actually is not just deliveries facilitated. It says any cannabis goods advertised or offered for sale. So this also would incorporate advertising platforms that are advertising products without a licensee and license number attached. That's no longer okay. Um, and then this B is interesting as well. Placing When you're placing an order through that platform, you have to be aware of which retailer it's coming from and their license number prior to buying the product. So it's not that you go through the whole system and it's this blind process where I'm on platform XYZ going through it and I bought a product and then at the end when I get the receipt, I'm like, oh, this actually came from this dispensary. You have to know before you buy the product which dispensary is actually supplying that product. How do you, how do you determine whether or not somebody knows or doesn't know? Because you, you said it, and for example, I go on Weed Maps, I'm gonna see a dispensary owner. Um, is, that, is that enough? I don't know what the word knowing <laughs> well, there's a lot of that. <laughs> Where we go? I mean, it is interesting in this case because that's what I highlighted at the top. I mean, the, the, there's uh, the, where the onus is placed is something that I like to look at. That it's the licensed retailer and micro business has to ensure that it's it's visible enough. So that makes it um, interesting that you then begin to question the fine legal minds of is it not the platform's responsibility to make sure that in information is visible or it's the retailer's responsibility the to make sure it's because that they would be the one. Do you level the playing field for small dispensary owners and retailers? I think it's more about um, consumer safety. So mm -hmm. consumers know it, where they're getting products from. And, and if something bad happens with a product or, or if there's some other you know, non-compliance that's a threat to public health, you know, the, the BCC has a record and they can go up that trail to know where, where the product came from. I'll only ask one more question, and that is the, the thing about legal versus illegal. I assume this is aimed at the events. So I'm going to put anybody on the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it really does protect the licensed uh, dispensary, which is great. It does. I mean, and that's something I like to remember is that as much as like the Bureau of Cannabis Control is, the, you know, the agency we're kind of most familiar with maybe in the industry, that they're housed under the Department of Consumer Affairs. And the Department of Consumer Affairs, like, 
you know, reason for being is to protect consumers from deceptive or misleading advertising and, and, and public safety in those aspects. So a lot of when you're going through the statement of reasons, one of the things that comes up consistently with the BCC is that there was confusion around this. And when people are reporting, how is this person doing this? They don't have a license. I don't understand. I don't know where this product came from. That's what they're responding to is that visibility on the consumer side of who am I getting this from? Where do I come from? And ultimately, it's going to be important for the industry because when we move into you know, the, our litigious future and you're dealing with product liability, consumer reliability, all of that information has to be apparent for the consumer of who did I get this and where did, I, where did it come from? And, and I think it goes back to their overarching theme, which is they don't want unlicensed people engaged in commercial cannabis activity. So it's, it's really showing that these technology platforms aren't the ones who are the licensed entities, aren't the ones who are filling orders, aren't the ones who are delivering. They're not doing commercial cannabis activity. The onus is to make sure it's clear to the public, to the customer, where they're getting a product from. And I think, I mean, like we said, part of it, I think, is the reaction of the agency from the response that they've had when they've, when they've made outreach and enforcement efforts uh, or requests of large technology platforms that their response was, well, actually, we're not under your purview, so have a nice day, that they went, let me get my pencil out and yeah. <laughs> make that not the case. So I will always give diplomacy goes a long way. <laughs> just maybe don't pick a street fight just yet. Um, so, and this is the last piece of that, is that even on the required sales invoices and receipts, again, that you have to disclose that licensed retailer and the license. Already they're in the delivery reg. Yeah, like the, that's, exactly, that that was in record keeping requirements anyway. Um, so just let's keep talking about delivery, because there's a few more things on that. Um, the other aspect of delivery, I didn't drop the slide in here, and, uh, but, but one of the things that did stay is that uh, you can deliver to any municipal municipality whether or not they have a ban. That piece is still in there. Um, the state is hanging tough. They believe that, it has, you know, that access must be preserved. So we'll see what happens with that, what the League of Cities response is going to be. We'll see, but the, the BCC is sticking by it. Um, they did make some alterations to what we've been calling the dynamic piece of it, which is that it had gone up in that um, revision to that you could carry $10,000 worth of product in a delivery vehicle. You could drive around the block until so you got a call if you, could give, if you got an order within half an hour, minutes, yeah. um, while the rest of the industry goes through extraordinary security measures. A lone delivery driver could make an order in their trunk in the middle of a public road. <laughs> Um, they got some responses about that. <laughs> they got some responses. So they've scaled it back a little bit. So now it's the, the, you can't have value in excess of $5,000 at any time in a delivery vehicle. And that the value of the goods carried in the vehicle um, that was not received in process by the licensee prior to the delivery departer, departing can't exceed $3,000. So pretty much you have to have if I'm doing the math right, because so many of these things hurt my brain, uh, you have to have a $2,000 set of prepackaged orders to leave, and you can have $3,000 of additional inventory in the car um, as a delivery driver. But as a delivery driver, I can do multiple stops. Mm -hmm. You can do multiple stops, yeah. So you can leave with those $2,000 of orders set and then continue to get orders on the fly. I mean, look at this section carefully. There's still more record keeping requirements and the inventory log requirements, and, and there's more finesse to how this has to go down. Uh, but, but this is the amount of or retail, cost? retail cost. It's the retail value of the products in the car. Um, oh dear, what I do? Okay, there we go. Um, so another beautiful one is that a vehicle used in the delivery can't have any markings or other indication on the exterior of the vehicle that may indicate they're a delivery employee. Maybe not have been the best idea ever to be like the geek squad driving around being like, come over, I got weed. Um, so, so they're saying pretty much, please don't drive around advertising your vehicle industry. Um, this part is interesting. There's been some confusion around this fully enclosed box was added to clarify 
that no portion of the enclosed box container or cage can be comprised of any part of the vehicle or the trailer. This is also mirrored in uh, distribution vehicles because what was happening is people, you know, got a sprinter van and they dropped a cage in the back and they're like, it's a cage. So the, the state is clarifying for better or for worse, the, the, the security on the inside of the vehicle has to be its own cage, like that it can't, you can't be using the sides of the car or caging in the vehicle itself. It has to be a distinct, fully enclosed little lockbox inside of your vehicle. Wouldn't that make it easier for someone who wants to steal this stuff? It also has to be bolted, bolted to down. your vehicle. Okay. So, I mean, there's, again, read the whole thing because <laughs> it's that, that um, it has to actually be bolted um, it, so, but, but it can't be that, uh, you just put welding inside of, you know, the back of it. So you open the door, they want that secondary thing. So nobody just cuts through your door or opens the side door and there you go. Uh, so, um, this is a bi this is a new big record keeping piece for delivery. Um, some technology platforms that I know are ready for this, <laughs> which is great. Uh, so at all times, you had to identify where your drivers were. So if the BCC walked in and they go, where's all your drivers? You had to be able to pull it up and, and identify them on GPS immediately. Now you also have to document the history of all locations traveled to by a delivery employer why, while they're delivering. So they want in that history, that turn by turn history of where they went and what they did and what their route was now falls under that 90 day record keeping requirement. So when you're looking at your GPS, you know, delivery platform technologies, that's going to be your new question is, do you have turn by turn, you know, coordinates that are stored for 90 days for every delivery driver and where they went and what they're doing. Um, and that helps with that dynamic piece as well, because again, I mean, so much of what we're up against is obviously like in an industry such as this that is pervaded by so much stigma and fear, the way we get out of this is through total transparency. <laughs> they want to know who it is, where's the money, where'd you go, what did you do, who'd you talk to, what were you wearing? They want to know everything that we're doing. Um, so this is just uh, another clarifying thing and, and another record keeping requirement. Um, I love this one so much. Uh, so while transportation by means of aircraft, watercraft, drone, rail, human powered vehicle or unmanned vehicle is prohibited, you can now deliver to Catalina. Just so you know, you can distribute to Catalina. <laughs> they threw that one in there. Um, it's going to be interesting because obviously to go to Catalina, you have to pass through either federal airspace or federal water. Yeah. Did the Coast Guard get that memo? I don't know if they did. <laughs> I don't know if they did. And I'm also loving the fact that like, I, there is not a single uh, auto ferry that goes to Catalina. Right. So if you're trying to fulfill your distribution requirements with a distribution vehicle and you can't put your truck on a boat to take it to the island, somebody's going to have to hand carry, which isn't allowed. What, what's the VIN number on that boat? What's the VIN <laughs> number? Who leases that boat? And does the Coast Guard know who that is? Um, and you know, it takes approximately like 20 years to get a vehicle like authorized on Catalina. They don't like cars coming there. So I don't know if there's an available compliant uh, distribution vehicle on Catalina, but I'm sure somebody will figure it out. Because as I always say, if the cannabis industry is one thing, it's wily and smart. We will find a way. Now that they've given us permission, we're going to Catalina. <laughs> we're going to go. Um, this was another doozy for some brands, I'm sure. This came under the uh, marketing cannabis goods as alcoholic products. You cannot do it anymore. Doesn't matter if they have it or not. You can't advertise them as cannabis beer or wine or vodka or anything. The, the, a spirit wine or beer, we're done. Um, obviously, this just this entire you know businesses are are decimated in this confusion. So it'll be interested in saying that. You know, and this again comes under that consumer affairs part. The claim in this case is that it's a matter of confusion and they don't want consumers to be confused that this non alcoholized cannabis beer maybe is actually beer. Um, that's why some of them out there are using terms like hoppy water. Hoppy water, hoppy sparkly water. water. So, I mean, but that will also, I would imagine, be a matter of interpretation of, 
you know, again, like when you were saying, what are, what are these terms of knowing, like how much confusion in it is like, if it's a can with a pop top and it has hops, is that too close to beer for somebody? Or what is the interest behind that? So a lot of people are working on that, talking to the agencies, because part of this process too, is just getting more clarity from the agencies. What are they afraid of? Who's behind it? Who's lobbying for what? And like, how do we fix it? Um, so this is a lesson in kneecapping your sales 101 which is some other additions that they made. Uh, this part has you know, been of concern to me for a while. Obviously, the, the state kind of put forth this thing on the sale of non-cannabis goods in response to a lot of it was the CBD hemp products and saying like, no, 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 all you can sell is cannabis goods and cannabis accessories in your shop. They've now expanded that to cannabis goods, uh, cannabis accessories and branded in your own branded merchandise. Uh, I'm not sure if this is their intent, but it seems crazy to me that you can no longer sell Jack Herrera's The Emperor Wears No Clothes in a dispensary. You cannot sell educational books about cannabis in a dispensary. You can't sell Nag Champa in a dispensary. Um, this, this prohibition, uh, it, and this is just my personal concern, is that in an industry where on one hand, now we're allowing delivery to go to any municipality regardless of a ban, and then you have a retailer who is only allowed to do cannabis transactions, period, and cannot um, enliven that retail experience with any other cultural commodity that they may want to include in their store. You can't sell crystals, you can't sell art, you can't sell records, you can't do anything except sell cannabis, cannabis accessories, and your own branded promotional merchandise. And j just to clarify, so an, a dab rig would be an accessory because you use it to smoke, yes. but a book on cannabis would not be an accessory? Yes. Okay. How about Visine? <laughs> we can register as a cannabis accessory. I, but that is an area where I would desperately encourage um, comments and clarifications from the agency because I'm not sure that there, I think the intent is one place, but the fallout is another. I mean, obviously, lots of operators segment their space in their business, so they have their cannabis space over here, and then they have a regular retail space over here, because why would they pay taxes on, you know, on, on selling books and incense and stuff when they don't have to within their licensed premises? But it is, I mean, obviously, you guys know, there's so many beautiful, amazing, you know, experience-oriented dispensaries that sell, you know, essential oils and others, you know, just in other aspects that aren't necessarily uh, cannabis at all, but um, encourage you to, to make the trip and go to this place. It's because also a tax strategy for retailers yes. because separate streams of revenues aren't counted for I-280E. So a lot of retailers have adopted holistic wellness um, shops within their retail space or, or another you know, type of business to have that separate revenue to make rent and other things, employees deductible. And, and just, you think this clause is a, is a direct reaction from this uh, BCC to people selling CBD stuff? Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're basically throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah. just because they fear yeah. that one thing. So because you can't sell hemp, you also can't sell Doritos. Like <laughs> to be like it's all gone, you know, and and uh, it, and I think that's a challenge, especially as f brick and mortar retailers work to distinguish themselves as a destination in in contrast to delivery models where it's more just transactionary, you know, because it's that question of why are people going to make the trip ultimately, and that so much of that usually has to do with the education, the experience, and the ancillary things that are there. Um, so they also added some definitions. One of them is the promotional materials, uh, which, you know, is they had to add that for clarity because distributors are allowed to transport them and retailers are, it's the one thing you're allowed to give away is, is uh, promotional materials. And it's a very limited definition. It can have no uh, intrinsic or secondary value. A battery is not a promotional material. A lighter is not a promotional material. It's literally the flyers and information that goes with the product, you know. Um, they also, because they love to insert themselves in processes, created a new definition for branded merchandise. So that is clothing, hats, pencils, pens, keychains, mugs, water bottles, beverage glasses, notepads, lanyards, cannabis accessories. If it's not that, it, other types of merchandise approved by the Bureau. So there is this process now of approval 
of having your branded merchandise that has to be approved by the bureau. Um, I would like to challenge all of you to troll the agency by making up the most ridiculous branded merchandise and submitting it for approval every day. <laughs> so I can think of all sorts of crazy things I want to propose. So they outline this process for branded merchandise approval. So if you want to sell something that is not clothing, hats, pencils, pins, keychains, mugs, water bottles, beverage glasses, notepads, lanyards, or cannabis accessories, you have to receive written approval from the bureau before you sell it. So you can't start selling it. I got this great idea. Start selling and then send it. You need that approval in advance. You have to send them a picture of the item uh, and, and get written approval and to, to sell the stuff. So, and I love their statement of reason. They clarify that the approval has to be obtained in writing to avoid confusion about whether they approved it. So there you go. <laughs> I believe that is the definition of Ouroboros, like a snake eating its own tail. Just like, so you know. Um, just in case you thought there was anything you could advertise for free, please just stop saying free. Just eliminate it from your vocabulary. It doesn't exist. They doubled down more in the uh in the readopt of the in the first proposal we got this edition of the buy one get one free free product with any donation and contest sweepstakes and raffles no go uh and now they've included you shall not advertise free cannabis goods or giveaways of any type of product including non-cannabis products so now you can't even say come to the store and get a free t-shirt come to the store and get a free lighter you just can't say it um, I, you can do it, but you can't say it. <laughs> there you go. Is that, is that like discount coupons also? Well, the discount coupons, I would say, is not buy one, get one free. As long as you don't say buy one, get one free on the coupon, that's not what it is. It's not a free product with a donation. Off. Yes. Oh, okay. But you will run into other issues because there are other issues with advertising the price of an item, as I understand with cannabis. Like you have to parse these with the rest of the advertising regulations because there, there was other specifics about things that, and a lot of this runs into, because we like to keep it complicated, you also have to look at your local ordinances for what advertising is. Like there's certain local ordinances that will prohibit you from advertising price, showing a picture of a cannabis plant. Like there's certain things you cannot do in advertising. It's very restrictive. Again, I would encourage everyone to try to be as compliant as possible with advertising, because if you look at models like Nevada, and they're incredibly stringent advertising restrictions where much like our branded merchandise here, every single advertisement in Nevada has to be approved by the bureau, by the agency. So I don't, I mean, I would imagine every magazine is a quarterly because I don't know how they would have time to like be like approve every single, every single advertiser has a, a registered agent card. Every single advertiser has to be verified as a licensed uh, business. So there, if, if and, and clearly from looking at the technology platform uh, language, Lori Ajax got her hands on some of that Nevada regulation. So if they just keep going, they're going to get to um, the advertising part. And we might see more stringency in those areas. Branding, are those branding approvals by the BCC, are they free? Or, or is there going to be a fee? They did not put any language in about a fee for those. So we would hope that's just incorporated in the licensing fees, which also went up, you know. So we'll see. So stop saying free. There's no free samples. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing. I always love to point out uh, th there's some discrepancy. It kind of is like a deep dive, because if you're a Los Angeles person, you know, the BCC says you can't give free cannabis goods to anybody. Now that's been extended a little bit. Um, uh, or actually, that, that's you cannot provide free cannabis goods except for in the very limited um, medical card scenarios. Business and Professions Code says you can't give away any amount of cannabis or cannabis products or any cannabis accessories as part of a business promotion or commercial activity. And Los Angeles Department of Cannabis Regulations says you cannot provide free samples of any type, including cannabis, to anybody. So you're not allowed to give anybody anything in L.A. Um, so that also means your approved coasters with your brand name on it, you can't give those away either? You cannot give away branded merchandise, no, that I understand. So you, in Los Angeles. Free samples. Uh, but in LA, free samples of any type, including cannabis goods. 
I don't. <laughs> That's a different story altogether. I mean, an exit bag is now a mandatory thing that you have to give everybody. I don't think that they consider that branded merchandise, but that would be an interesting clarifying point to make with them to say, do you have to have those approved considering that it's something walking out the door? Um, I always, I always think though, from a legal perspective, I love this definition in the definitions of free cannabis goods. It says it means any amount of cannabis goods provided to any person without cost or payment or exchange of any other thing of value. That's an interesting phrase to me <laughs> of like, what is another thing of value? Because I would think that there may be an argument somewhere that like getting somebody's email address is a thing of value from a business. Having somebody join your, you know, membership VIP program is a thing of value. I don't know that anybody's really gone down that road of arguing that. We're, we're not at that point. <laughs> but, it's, but it's there. And just remember that it's there. Um, so, uh, if you, were worried, if you were interested in compassion or equity programs, they added equity, one word. There, they, there, there it goes. Uh, for all the comments about compassionate use, obviously SB 829, the Wiener Bill passed in Senate, wasn't signed by the governor, so we didn't get the uh, tax relief for compassion programs. Um, the Bradford Bill, SB 1294, did get passed and signed, the California Cannabis Equity Act of 2018 which gives a fund to begin to help to facilitate uh, local programs. Um, I mean, th this is an area of interesting confusion for me in uh, implementation as well, to say that in addition to the free cannabis goods, which is giving to the, the card holders in the city, that a licensee may donate cannabis goods and the use of equipment in compliance with any local compassionate use equity or similar program. Um, so it could be that this is yet another indication of where we need to work at the local level for having those compassion programs and equity programs actually uh, clarified and implemented, since it does seem to give us some sort of uh, ability to, to interface and provide services to those um, populations. So uh, continuing the whip, how's everybody doing? You guys doing all right? <laughs> yeah, we're good. There's so much I want to say. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what time it is. Uh, is yeah. Back to the um, giving things out. So when a distributor comes and, and uh, we receive an order, and they always give some sample products. Mm -hmm. um, are we able to give those to management, to, you know, some of those samples? I mean, that's where it gets confusing because they give you these free samples. Yeah. And then the, is there a way, that, is there a form, is there a way that we need to write down? You know, who they're going to. And that's I, I mean, short answer, no. Um, there are manufacturing and distribution companies that are getting or contemplating getting delivery licenses, retail delivery licenses, so that they can compliantly deliver product to their own staff. You know, because that's one of the areas, because uh, the, the state has felt so shackled um, by this no free products aspect and that the entire back-end sales process was something that was seemingly ignored um, there are really difficult mechanisms that people are going through in terms of those basic questions of sales how does a manufacturer seeking a distributor entice that distributor to work with them when they can't give them a sample, you know, until it's gone all the way through the distribution chain and been approved. So, so obviously everybody right now is doing all of their crafty workarounds and thinking that they've managed this system. But my concern is that a lot of those workarounds will be incredibly difficult once track and trace turns on because there's not going to be a category for, oh, I gave it to my staff, you know, <laughs> or, or what did I do? So, so those kind of fundamental aspects of, the supply chain, how business is done, how, how uh, employees get educated about products. Like it would be preposterous in another market to think that you go into a wine bar and you ask the, the, the wine guy, what do you recommend? They're like, I don't know. I'm not allowed to, to I have no idea. Like, be like, like uh, let's read the box. <laughs> like that, that's, so, so I mean, obviously we're in a, we're in a, a process of baby steps. But that's that's. So in order to be compliant, when those samples come to us, what do we do with those? 
Well, <laughs> well, they wouldn't come. They wouldn't come for free. They'd come, you know, documented and billed and put on your your thing because you need paper for it. Yeah, it's in the manifest. The very interesting thing that I find is that, and this is where some of the agencies are ahead of others. The CDTFA, the tax agency, actually has a really good descriptive uh, uh, tax scheme for a product that is given to a retailer or buyer and consumed and never makes it to retail. They seem to recognize that that scenario exists and they're like, and this is how you deal with the taxes for that. But like many things, I mean, in cannabis in, the, in LA, like the tax agency was way ahead of the regulations. They're like, absolutely, you can pay us for that. Um, so, so it's, uh, and honestly, I mean, honestly, that's what people hire like lawyers and compliance people to do is to be like, how do I map a compliant process that's gonna stand up to track and trace, that's gonna satisfy the state's requirements, and that can actually allow me to move things through the supply chain in, a, in, in the right way. Um, I mean, the concern that I have now, uh, and then I'll keep moving through because there's more I wanna say, but the concern that I have now is, um, and not just because I'm a compliance consultant, but, but it's difficult for people to prioritize compliance when they're just trying to survive. Like where obviously everybody's just like, I'm just trying to keep the doors open. I don't have time to make sure that I'm papering this process correctly or whatever. But um, as friendly as the agents may seem when they come to you know, check out your place, I like to be like, these are not your friends. They have five years to, to levy penalties and fines against things that you're, you did day one. Uh, the tax agency has said they absolutely will go back and audit year one. The record keeping requirements for cannabis companies went into effect back on January 1st. So uh, everyone that was feeling that they had all this leeway because they're like, oh, well, track and trace isn't on, so I can do that. I'm going to bring in this product. I'm going to do that. When they show up and they're like, okay, we need to review your records audit for like for this year. Um, you know, th that's just it's the question is like, what position is that going to put you in? And we'll get to it at the end. You'll see the the cultivation department put in their penalties for uh, record keeping. The operational penalty for working without a license maxes out at $5,000. Like if, you, if you're operating without a license, it's a severe infraction. Obviously you can get your license revoked, whatever, but the fine is $5,000. In the record keeping section of administrative failures, the max fine is $30,000 per instance. So they are not kidding <laughs> about record keeping. And it sounds so boring, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's the hardest thing in this moment to, to convince people that this is something you should be thinking about. Um, Just quickly, is it too late, do you think, to request that change where the whole industry says, look, we get you don't want us to give consumers free samples, but can we have some pathway to the B2B you know, typically. I, I think I think it, I think it's it's never too late. <laughs> this is my thing. No. Um, th this is you know the final regs aren't final. This is always going to be an evolving process. Uh, it may be too, it may be too late. I mean it's not too late in terms of I think everybody should comment on it. It should be on record. Your voice should be heard. It's a public record. They this we have to document our existence and our feelings. But. Um, but one of the things, one of the glimmers of hope that a lot of people are looking to as well is in November, we're going to have a new governor and we are going to have a governor most likely that really supports the cannabis industry and supports efficient business so that you have the option of where this regulatory tweaking period will end. You know, th this isn't over by a long shot. There's 70 bills that are going to be introduced on cannabis in January you know, or more probably by the time we get to January, there's a huge amount of uh, legislative change that can happen as well. And that's kind of the more um, master strokes that we need is somebody to go in and really correct some of the things that were caused in the drafting of Mercursa. I mean, anybody knows me, like one of my big pet peeves is like, Alma was an adult use bill with a 15% excise tax that got combined with a medical program and put an adult excise tax on medical goods. How that happened, I don't know. Like, but it, but that should be undone. And there's a lot of areas where people are working, you know, to change those things. 
the di and the other thing that I'll say is that like, you know, for this very moment we're sitting in right here, these are not the rules. These are still the proposed rules, you know? So we still have 12 days of comments, a new introduction of a draft. So, I mean, it's, it, it's incredibly difficult, I understand, as operators to be like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know, you're trying to make packaging and they keep changing every aspect of it, which is the next thing we'll cover really quick. It, it's difficult to be that responsive, but it's also, you know, the, it's, it's unfortunately the, the race that we're in is having to be that, that nimble. So um, you may have seen that uh, CRP is back, sort of, but not really. Um, so uh, they kind of entered this halfway thing where, so now prior to January 2020, it has to be tamper evident, but it doesn't have to be child resistant or resealable unless if you go to the Department of Public Health, where if it has multiple uses, then it does have to be resealable. Um, and then after, then starting in 2020, it's gonna have to be that resealable, tamper evident and child resistant. Um, so until that day, uh, the Department of Public Health says you can meet those packaging requirements through the use of an exit bag. Uh, this is kind of, I was talking to somebody from the Department of Public Health about this because it's almost like, you know, we had the environmental argument of like, oh my God, it's too much packaging or the industry's not ready and this is terrible. And then we had the, oh my God, I don't want to do exit bags or why don't we just do it that way? And now it seems they just did all of it at the same time. They're just like, great. <laughs> so now we're going to have literally, literally all cannabis goods purchased by a consumer can't leave the pre premises unless they're in an opaque exit package, which prior to January 2020 has to be resealable, child resistant and opaque. So now we find ourselves in the Kafka-esque world in which child resistant packaging is going to be put in a child resistant exit bag to leave the store. Um, so uh, all of our worst fears are being realized. Um, and then after 2020, you know, you can have tote bags. This is insane. Um, so, and, and they did clarify that immature plants and seeds don't have to be shoved into an exit bag. So that's nice. Um, uh, the, please comment on this. <laughs> so, um, please do. Uh, I, I mean, anybody that was coming at this from the, I mean, Peter, the Future Canvas Project had, a, had an event we're talking about the, the coming ecological disaster and lack of sense that it has that in a state where we outlaw plastic bags and straws, we're like, but we're going to package the shit out of this. Um, it's, like, it's insane. Um, and that now, and that honestly, now that the problem has been even duplicated, like, and, and it's difficult because that's what I was talking about to, to the Department of Public Health is the last thing I want is more onus put on a retailer who has to have both tote bags and exit bags and be like, is this child resistant? Or not? I don't know. Which one do I do? So putting it all in exit bags, fine. But, um, but it, it's super messy. It's super messy. And there's a lot of, there's big packaging lobbies that are the, the kind of drove this change. It was gonna be exit bags. It was gonna be like, you know what, we'll just do exit bags. And then the packaging lo lobby was like, we need packaging, um, you think? Uh, and in, uh, it's complicated. But again, this is one of the, I had, a, I had a great conversation with the Department of Public Health about, um, Unfortunately, we're up against this timeline because the emergency regs are going to be, expire. They need to have permanent regulations and we're going to have to continue to work on them. I think for the packaging, at least from the Department of Public Health, there, there seems to be this kind of openness to this is an area that's going to require more nuance than we have time for. It is not a one size fits all solution. My pie in the sky fantasy, I think the first place for us to really pull back packaging is not going to be on edibles because there's just too many freakishly terrified people who think you're, they're going to eat a blueberry and jump off a balcony or something, um, but is in the flower market because the flower is the part that's just insane to think that it's all being prepackaged in this incredibly onerous tiny little bottles and stuff. And, and one of the arguments that I've made to the departments is even in the pharmaceutical model, when you go to CVS, the big drug companies ship bulk powders and pills to CVS. And the pharmacist fills your prescription and puts it in a little bottle and gives it to you. 
and that is a tracked and traced process. And once we have track and trace, I think that is an area where we will be able to eliminate a huge swath of packaging because once they have visibility on every single gram of, of cannabis that's moving through the system, there is no reason we cannot return to that system. And for years I've been talking to them about when they think about products moving through the chain, they're thinking about beers and cigarettes. And they're thinking about things with these, with shelf lives and just standardized processes. And in the case of flour, I keep telling them, you need to think about a tomato. You need to think about how many, how many people do you want to touch your tomato before you get to eat it, you know? And when you go to the grocery store, you don't just go up to the guy at the counter and be like, I want a tomato. You like to see the freaking tomatoes. You like to go, mm, I like that apple. You know, th th that is an experience. And again, that's one of the possible distinguishing things that would, that would support brick and mortar retailers and the ability to be like, I wanna go to the store because I wanna choose the exact, you know, piece, the, the exact flower that I wanna try. And they seem receptive to that, but who knows, you know, we'll see. But I think that's something, I think that's an easy win. Cause the other thing is from the public safety perspective, if a kid gets into a bag of flour and eats it, who cares? Like nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> They're gonna be fine. Yes. So if something is packaged improperly, who would be held accountable at this point? Would it be whoever is uh, providing the exit bag or is, would it be the individual licensee that packaged it improperly? Well, it's, this is a big question that I have in terms of where that liability lies, because if they show up in your retail establishment and you have improperly packaged, labeled products on your shelf, they may seize it. Um, they can be like, this is, this is not right. In terms of when we see, you know, they've, they've moved from the friendly, like tear off sheet warning to like certified letters now of like it notices to comply. So they've gone to like stern letter writing. Um, but I think in January, we will start to see the actual levying of penalties and fines for, for some of, I mean, the most egregious things that they've actually done fines for so far has been when people don't allow you, if, they, if you don't let them in, you will get a fine to be like, no, you can't come in. Um, but I mean, this is why internal compliance programs are so important because now that they've added this aspect of you can reject a shipment if it's not packaged and labeled correctly, it suggests to me that some of that onus is going to be on the retailer because you never should have taken it. You shouldn't have accepted that product if it's not labeled correctly. So this is why everybody should have their packaging and labeling checklist for when the product arrives, you sit there and you go through all of those labeling requirements. I just want to add one thing to what Julie's saying about the notices to comply. They, they have started doing it, and they're a little bit more than just stern letter writing. Like that's like the one step you're at. <coughs> like this is your final warning before we bring disciplinary proceedings mm -hmm. against you. They ask you to come up with a plan of correction, how you're going to address this and, and ensure it's not going to happen again. But if you fail to respond to them, there may be discipline. If they're not satisfied with your response, there could be discipline. It, it's, it's not something to brush aside, and, and we've mm -hmm. dealt with them already at this point, a couple of them. And, and you know, the one lesson is that you know, an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, because as soon as you get that notice to comply in the mail, you're gonna be calling up your lawyer saying, hey, I got this in the mail, I need to respond to it, and they're gonna be asking you for a $10,000 retainer. Start looking at these issues now before the regulators are coming to your door. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot cheaper to work with me than to have that moment. <laughs> but, but, uh, but the other thing is they don't give you a lot of time. Those notices to comply say you have 15 days to inform us that this is fixed, not just tell us how you're going to do it. It's 15 days to say it's done, the product's gone, stuff is disposed, this is how I corrected it. And give us the proof that it's fixed. Yeah, and not just say it. And, it, and don't just say, like, we did a training. It's <laughs> like you have to document those. Like, there's... There's all sorts of aspects of that. So um, I call this the CDP headaches. Because um, th if you notice in the CDPH regulations, the Department of Public Health Manufacturing, they were just confusing as all get out because they did this awesome thing where instead of just putting all the regulations in one place, they put asterisks for the parts that weren't changed and just didn't print them at all. And then if it was uh, added, then it was in blue. And if it was um, removed, it was in red. So, you, you know, you got, you got all these calls of people being like, oh, there's no more security requirements or whatever. This is great. And it's like, no, no, no you got to go back 
So literally you had to have the old version and the new version to figure out what changed and then go back and reference the parts that weren't changed. So my first ask for them is, could you please just put it all in one document? Because that would be a lot easier. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. The, the packaging was the kind of one of the biggest ones that's getting the most atten attention for this. Um, it, you know, when, when 2020 kicks in, there's going to be all of these packaging requirements that kick in. Um, and, and even a new uh, labeling piece in 2020, which is if a package is not intended to be inhaled or, a, or the ones that are intended to be inhaled and aren't, um, or topicals and aren't child resistant after opened, it has to say, this package is not child resistant after opening. So if you were worried about your labeling real estate now, you got one more line to stick in there. Um, they did get a little more clear on the definition of child resistance because people were just like, is this baggy OK? Um, and so there is a lot more clarity in terms of what they are going to consider uh, child resistant. I loved the addition that speaks so much, this one word that came in there, cannabis product quantity, equality of homogeneity. Because homogeneity is like the bane of the industry right now. Evidently, the testing labs are telling the manufacturers you guys are not good at homogeneity. <laughs> it's causing a lot of problems in testing. Um, so there's a lot of indications that the Department of Public Health is really drilling into those good manufacturing processes and making sure that people really know how to make a food grade consistent product. Um, in the master manufacturing protocol, you know, they kind of inserted a little more information about that homogeneity word coming up, which is mitigating through the, against the potential for adulteration through incorporation of incorrect amounts of cannabinoids, unintended ingredients, hazards in the product quality plan, uh, potential for misbranding through incorporation of ingredients not identified on the label or the mislabeling of product. Um, I didn't make a slide for that for this, but they, they now reference out to like the federal uh, FDA regulations for ingredients, for how you mark artificial ingredients, natural flavor, these kind of aspects of what are the federal requirements for disclosure of those ingredients. Because, you know, people are, who are like, it's cannabis and apples are, are, you have to kind of get a little more clear on a lot of those um, aspects. You all will, manufacturers out there will soon be very familiar with the health and safety code. If you're not already, they've added 21 references to the health and safety code now pointing out um, mostly it was you know, they, they articulated in their, in their summary that it's, they're revising the good manufacturing processes to provide greater clarity to the process and documentation required when making uh, cannabis products. And, and really went deep on, on pointing to the health and safety code on, on 21 different points, saying you need to follow these guidelines for how to meet these requirements of, of good manufacturing. Um, most of it is in that uh, 40240 grounds building and manufacturing premises section. That's the section that has the lion's share. So this was a big one that a lot of people I know missed because it seems simple, but it's super lame um, in my opinion. Uh, they've changed the language um, from business days to calendar days. In the case of things such as if you lose connectivity with the track and trace system and the system goes down for a couple of weeks and you have to log everything is on paper and you still have those three days to insert all your information, those are now three calendar days, not three business days. So if connectivity comes back up on a Friday, you're going to be paying overtime for the weekend for everybody to insert all of your documentation. So in many cases, and especially I'm thinking about farmers up north, these were tight timelines anyway of having to report every change in disposition of your flowering into track and trace within three days. And now those three business days are three calendar days. So even something as small as that has a huge impact on these timelines. A lot of it is that that track and trace training now is required in five calendar days of uh, issue, license issuance. So if you get that license on a Friday, two of your days <laughs> are done, you know, if you're not working through the weekend. So it's, it's really critical, yes. So did they also include the federal holidays into that calendar day? I, they did not. 
I mean, it doesn't look like they don't know if they had. They did not add a definition of calendar day in which are exempted from those calendar days. So again, if I may highlight a really simple one for, for commenting to say, why? Why are you doing this? The thing that I love, and I, I wanted to drop it in there, but I didn't have time, is that there's a, there's a um, in, in one of the instances where it's the agency's onus to respond to something, theirs is in business days. So the industry has to function on calendar days, but the agencies get business days. So it does seem a little unfair. Um, what time is it? I don't have, I don't have a clock. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm almost there, I think. <laughs> so there's so much. Um, in cultivation, uh, there were some other clarifications that were made. One of the big ones was on areas that cannot be shared by multiple licensees. Um, again, people who have been doing licensing, this may not come as a surprise, but it's additional clarification was made of that you cannot share these areas and then um, more clarity around shared areas that have to be contiguous and, and what the designation is for what's happening there. Um, th this has been something that many of us you know, who have undergone the audits from them have seen coming. They added in cultivation plan requirements a signed attestation that says you're going to contact the appropriate county agricultural commission commissioner regarding requirements for legal use of pesticides. Um, this is when the CDFA has been coming with the county ag commissioner. They want to know, do you have your applicator license and your operator ID? So all of the cultivators have to be going. You have to get your, you have to take a class. You got to read a book, you got to do stuff, you have to get your applicator license and your operator ID. And the fact that they have now gone to put this into signing an attestation to say you're going to do it um, means that they, I mean, they're seeing a lot of noncompliance in this area, that people are, are dragging their heels and not doing it. And this was the one I was talking about, the importance of record keeping. Just to look at that section in the administrative actions on record keeping, the licensee can be subject to a citation and fine, which may be issued as a notice of violation of up to $30,000 per individual violation um, for record keeping. For uh, engaging in commercial cannabis without, an without a license or with an unlicensed per person, that's five grand. For record keeping, it can be up to $30,000 per instance. So that's my ad for compliance. Um, more fun stuff. Uh, Oh, this is hard. So uh, we all knew that the temporary program was expiring on December 31st. What is kind of interesting news in their um, thing is that once the uh, um, new proposed regulations are accepted in early January, the Bureau is no longer accepting temporary license applications when those go into effect. So pretty much in this interpretation of this, we lose the last possible three weeks of December to hope that you get that temporary license application in and you can get that you know, New Year's Eve thing. Um, so they're not, they're not gonna accept it. There seemed to be some confusion. Lori was speaking at the event yesterday and she's like, I'm gonna be doing licenses and we're gonna take it to the last minute. <laughs> you know, um, so we'll see, because <laughs> what it says is that they're not gonna accept it. So we'll have to hope that uh, those, those temporary licenses get in because obviously if you do not have a temporary license by the end of the year, uh, you do not qualify for the um, provisional license program. So we're it, sitting on an empty building until all of your final licenses and permits are issued and, and we all know the costs associated with that for folks who have gone through that process. Especially finishing CEQA and stuff like that, that, that will become a very long process for those who are not able to operate through that process and make any income until they get their annual permit. That's bad. Uh, goodbye teen plants market. Um, so the, the BCC introduced a new definition of immature plant, which is anything um, over 18 inches. Uh, I have a lot of questions about this one because they say it's necessary because they didn't have a definition, so they made one up. Doesn't happen to be the same as the CDFA's definition. So that's cool. Um, so my questions around this would be if you're a retailer and you've taken in some plants and they grow tall, what do you do with them? You have to destroy them. You can't give them back. You can't sell them to anybody. You can't, you know, you can't send, send them back to a cultivator to have a nice prosperous life as an adult plant. Um, so this, you know, for that, that market of, you know, teenage plants that some people like, that's too bad. And goodbye, this is actually sort of a positive thing. Um, the 14 day reconciliation was replaced with a 30 day. Uh, reconciliation. So that mandatory um, 
track and trace requirement of, of uh, reconciling every 14 days is now at least once every 30 calendar days. And there was also a, a slight uh, rise in the, de the definition of a significant discre uh, discrepancy in inventory. It used to be $5,000 or 2% of your average daily sales, and now 5,000 is, is struck and it's 3% of your average um, monthly sales, sorry. It was whichever is less, but they took out the 5,000. So, so now it's just 3%. 3%. Yeah, or 2% or whatever's less. <laughs> They're like, it just, they're just making it up. Somebody's like, who knows? Um, a lot of people were responding to uh, this one added to premises location that shipping containers not affixed to the land are, not any, are no longer uh, permitted as a structure, is not considered a permanent structure. Modular buildings not affixed to the land, structures that rest on wheels or any structure that can be readily moved. Um, there was some panic around this because they're like, oh my God, all the pods. But part of it is it has to do with that affixing nature. And when you read their statement of reasons, it just makes me laugh because you know somebody's doing it. When you read it, you're like, they saw somebody do that, which is people with trailers that are like moving stuff around and being like, now we're over here and now we're going to put it over here. So their main thing is like, when you submit a premises diagram, those structures need to stay where they are. <laughs> you can't move them around. Um, so uh, there's a little more clarity around pre-rolls. Uh, that, that, you know, it had said that they could do it. Now it's just a little more clear that the, the distributor can package, repackage, label, and relabel cannabis, including pre-rolls for retail sale. As we were discussing, there's more questions risen because you're like, whose brand is it? Is it their brand? What do you do? What are you labeling it with? I have no idea. Um, but an important part in the, in the testing sequence to mark here is a licensed distributor uh, can't process it but can roll it if it you know, has that, and that they have to be rolled prior to the compliance testing. So it's not, yeah, boo, boo, um, yeah. Because, I mean, I have really interesting questions on it. Because, like, when you sample, when you take a representative sample of pre-rolls out of multiple packets of pre-rolls, you can't then repack those packets into full cartons. So you're just destroying, like, all, anyway, it's, it's a lot of... Um, I suggest. And if the batch, gross batch flour is tested in okay, like in the original product. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you imagine that that would be the case? But, like, as we've seen with some recall efforts and stuff like that, is their concern is that people are getting stuff text tested, then they're mixing it with other stuff, and then that final stuff is not clearing testing. So, I mean, this is, this is a ripe area for comments. It makes very little sense that if a bulk cannabis bag passes the COA and then you roll it, that then you got to test it again. Um, Does this mean that branding now should be done on the distributor's level? That is the, I mean, this is what we were talking about, is the, the, the clarity that needs to be had around that, because while you're able to do that activity, if you're a distributor who's buying bulk flour and rolling it, Exactly. Whose brand are you releasing it as? Is are you do? I mean, because there, I would imagine there's multiple arrangements there. Some you might be doing it for another existing brand. Some you might be doing it in house, and then it, are they going to consider that crossing into manufacturing? <laughs> like, or that there's a lot of questions around this. Yes. Um, when you look at the BCC rule or the FDA or Food and Ag rules about processors gathering stuff. Let's call it stuff. Yeah. At the bottom of a container or sifting it. Wink, wink, mm -hmm. nod, nod. Um, they're allowed to roll that, but I don't see where they can do anything more than that. Right. Uh, if they grind it up and send it down range to the distributor, says he can't process, but he can take that crappy flour, they sprinkle a little keep on it and roll it up. I'm just trying to see where that line of manufacturing Yeah. Is. No, and especially if, um, you, you know, there's the aspect of people doing infused P-rolls, which is, you know, that that has to happen. Yeah, right. This is the clarifications we need. Yeah. So you need, so we need yeah. to ask for clarification on that. Yeah. There is none as of right now. We don't know yeah. like what that policy yeah. is. Yeah. There actually is some clarification for that in manufacturing, right? It actually gives a, de a definition of a manufactured product. Yeah. Right. So what you were speaking mm -hmm. of. So yeah. Just, like, yeah, but they're doing it already, and they're cheap, not even cheap, but what's falls in the bottom of that barrel might get crushed up a little bit by, you know, if 
it's not only SOP, but now it's in the bottom of the world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and honestly, it's like, it's, it's, you know, the long story short is like California jumped the shark on regulations and we made so many regulations and now they're learning more about the industry. So they have to make more regulations to cover that part of the industry. And it's getting down to every single activity. And as I said, we're a wily bunch and we're going to exploit every loophole there possibly is to be able to stay alive. So so it's constant. It's like this game of whack-a-mole where it's it's. You know, we're, we're going to see a lot of that. I mean, and if I had a magic wand and could wave it, I would have said, like, can we start with four regulations that's like, you know, that protects testing taxes and public safety and just be like, let's work from there and it'll be great. Uh, but, you know, now we have this to contend with. So it's a lot of categories. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, I remember I remember long ago going to test the, the first like license. <laughs> The first um, when they were testing out the online licensing portal and their product categories for cannabis was like five things. And you're just like, you guys have no idea. Do you <laughs> like they didn't know there was no like they didn't know. The, I mean, the, 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 the maturity and the sophistication and the ingenuity of this industry is baffling to them of how many applications there are and how many things they've had to. It, you know, invent to be like, what do you do with a, you know, what do you do with a breath strip? Like, what do you do with a tincture that goes under your tongue that's a capsule? They're, that they didn't know that we had, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, we don't want it. Um, there, there was a big, uh, you know, this will help a lot in testing. Is that you know there was there was the issue of you know people sampling you know the lab shopping that they want to not happen where you can't send samples to multiple labs at the same time and take the results that you like. But then we had the problem of what happens when a lab goes down or if a lab loses their license or if the lab's really expensive machinery uh, breaks and then your products are stuck in this laboratory pipeline and there was no mechanism for labs to transfer that uh, product to another lab for testing or for you to be able to have another batch uh, sampled. So they've corrected that. I know the big ask from the... Um, uh, testing community again for these regulations is going to be about COA remediation because right now if there's a typo if they got the name wrong if anything happens the agency is like you can't fix it you can't talk about it it's no good so even if you submit something and they can't read your handwriting because of the prohibition on communicating with you with that once that uh, process has started they can't even be like what does this say <laughs> like what did you write down here so it's uh, some of that will um, get cleaned up Everybody across the board is going to get to do OSHA training. Yay! Um, 30 hours of general industry outreach course is going to happen. Good for you, OSHA. Um, so the main point is like, you know, be sure to comment. It's uh, absolutely essential for your business. It's great to get your, your voice in there. If you need help commenting, there's incredible uh, Trade organizations, you can get with your local trade organization. Uh, CCIA is going to be doing comments. Locally, there's lots of trade organizations and groups and collectives, and there's lots of smart people who will help you. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you these, uh, these, um, this PowerPoint, and then I'm going to try to create a hot list of just like, again, these are the main things that I would go after. Um, it's, a, it's a real great time to team up and, and work collectively to draft these statements. Letter, it's, it's, it, it's great for, to have a whole lot of individuals uh, submitting feedback. It's great to pair up and have these NASCAR letters of get every cultivator you know, every dispensary you know, to tag on and, and create group statements. But it's incredibly important um, that the agencies know that uh, we're, we're seeing this, we're reading this, and the real life impacts that it has on your business. Because those are sometimes the most compelling things for them is when you explain what the problem is and how this, how this you know, d harms your business or your ability to function in this thing. When you're commenting, always remember to comment to the right agency. If you're a micro business, don't send your cultivation issues to the BCC. They do not forward. <laughs> they don't send it on. Um, th that you make sure that you're aligning the regulation with the agency that issued it, and that is who you're commenting to. I think I'm done. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This is obviously a lot of overhead for a lot of people. It's going to cost them money, time, you know. Yeah. And then increasing, it gets a backdrop of an increasingly competitive 
retail landscape they're fighting against. 87 or some percent is very close to that. In the state of California, cannabis sales are actually illegal. So the question is, you can impose this on the licensees, and that's great, but what happens on the other side? I mean, it, there has to be enforcement. Yes. To get up. It's the only way that this math is all going to be. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that uh, it's important to clarify is that the regulatory authority of the agencies is over licensed operators. That's who they regulate. That's who they enforce upon. In terms of an unlicensed operator, that's an illegal activity at this point. So it is on the local law enforcement, working with local law enforcement and the local agencies to kind of work on those aspects. Um, you have some? Uh, yeah, I've got a question about the employer employee contracts where there's now a piece of the action comes into question. Yeah. Do you think those need to be reevaluated for perhaps renegotiation for language? Just it's give the the, um, the bureau, the information of an interest party. What do you think? Yeah, there's an interesting language shift um, that that reminds me of a, that I had it in there. The importance of a single word, where um, in one of the sections it used to say the formation documents, and now it says all formation documents. <laughs> where it's like, where they just slip that in there of like they don't want a single contract, side deal, something that's related to that business not submitted. And, and again, I know it's ridiculous and I know lawyers are expensive, but um, like this is a critical time to be looking at having good contracts with people, having good distribution contracts, good testing contracts, because the question is going to be what happens when something goes wrong? Like the question of is it the retailer's pro whose problem is that? That would be something you can know you should negotiate in a distribution contract to say if the BCC comes and you delivered me non-compliant product, guess who's going to pay my bill? You are. You know, the, those are the things that can be neg negotiated. Obviously, for a smaller operator, it's tough because you don't have a lot of power to be like, darn you, I'm, I want this. But you're going to want to negotiate those good contracts because one of my big fears is what's going to happen next year when they start levying penalties and fees and that you don't see the, ca the cannabis industry cannibalize itself in lawsuits because everybody's going to be blaming everybody else for what they did and, no, oh, this is wrong and this is your fault and whatever. And that's the stuff that can be clarified through that, those contract processes up front. Yeah? Do uh, events or, like, uh, educational seminars, um, conferences, do these that are cannabis-related but there's no actual sale of cannabis products? Do they actually fall under these parameters? Um, I mean, it's an interesting, like events is its own <laughs> like wormhole you can go down. They did make an exception for kind of educational events that was put in that don't, don't require a license when there is no consumption, there's no retail sales, there, those aspects. This seems to be an allowance for that to happen. And then, I mean, in some of the rules around some of the events that do have consumption in retail are, I mean, how anybody's ever going to, my favorite one in there is that every bit of product that comes in on the transport that, that is transported by a distributor is supposed to be physically checked by the event organizer licensee before it comes on premises. So load in for high times is going to be like a week ahead of advance, yet you can only get a permit for four days or something. So it's going to be a little rough, like uh, a compliantly bringing product on site when those the, those uh, aspects are so onerous. What about like events where you're actually not, again, you're not selling anything, but you're allowing people to smoke at your event. I mean, that, that kind of gets into an interesting terrain of like, yes, there's a way. I mean, and that's the other thing, too. I mean, the things that a lot of people panic about in these regulations, when you talk to the lawyers, they're like, eh, you know, they're, because, because again, for them, it's just a matter of, I mean, that's what we do all day long is just going like, this is what we want to do, and here's, you know, here's the winding route to get there and making sure you're covered. Yeah. Uh, I read through the remediation um, plans. I didn't look at the document to see if there's a form to check this off. When I asked Lori about uh, remediation, when you know the testing lab's wrong, my guys are doing informational testing online. We know it's clean. The testing lab says, sorry, you failed. Mm -hmm. Wait a second. I don't know that I'm clear of whether we can uh, remediation plan. Look, we can prove they're wrong. Can we get another test? Because my product's stuck. I can't get paid. That's the real Mm -hmm. right yeah, uh, I mean, there are a lot of conversations about that. It's, uh, 
I mean, part of the issue, again, is it's always like with with any re regulation, you know, my motto is always like follow the money, follow the fear, you know, where you're like, who's paying for it and what are they afraid of? So, I mean, one of the issues with testing and the, and the labs are super frustrated about this as well, some of them, is because the thing that they want to prevent through these aspects is lab shopping. They don't want you, you know, shopping around to get the results that you want. Um, but but one of the issues with like say a, a really really effective lab with really really sensitive equipment who's doing an amazing job is there's going to be inherent lab shopping because if there's this threshold and your your you know solvent or whatever is going to be detected at this lab but it's not going to be detected at this lab because their in equipment isn't as sensitive that lab shopping will become inherent because and then you'll have people gravitating towards crappier labs <laughs> because they're not going to see the things that maybe are there. So, you know, some of that, the increasing of the thresholds, I mean, a lot of the labs, uh, I mean, one of, one of the issues that we're up against is looking at phase three testing coming in and not even knowing is anything going to pass, you know, once heavy metals come into the effect, it will come into effect because this is the part where we're going to discover, like, what are your devices leaching? What is your packaging doing to your product? What are giant metal machines that extract your product putting into your product, you know, that, that, and, and that if we were... Uh, you know, again, my, my pie in the sky fantasies is I would love to see the state subsidizing and funding testing labs to be doing phase three testing right now. So we would collect the data to know what is going to happen when January 1 hits. And, and, and then we would love to have a counter thing that was like, and while we're at it, let's look at the amount of heavy metals in a banana. You know, it's like, like what are we up against? Um, go, go ahead. Well, I, I spent my career the other end where the insurance companies are now trying to figure out who caused this damage mm -hmm. in a product. Um, I think brass knuckles started the rolling. It don't matter what this the state requires you. If you get sued for a product, there are rules, regulations, yes. and case authorities that it cost you a lot of money. If you're not looking at how do I protect my product. And we're, we're concerned in some of the companies I have of these cheap ass yeah. cartridges from China gonna yep. reach out in real time. The sauce you make I mean, I'm telling people, take it on a journey, have it sit somewhere, get it hot, get it cold, mm -hmm. and how much time before somebody gets it, test it then. Because that's what they're going to get at the product level for real, and that's what's going to get you sued. And, that, and that's one of my big concerns for the industry itself, because there was not long ago, there was a law office holding a continuing learning class for uh, uh, attorneys on how to sue the cannabis industry. And it was a very long list from things like from product liability to dram laws to, you know, that they're going to come after the bud tender who served the person, the cannabis that got them in an accident before. So, I mean, this, this is most of my daily concern for the industry is not against enforcement from the agencies. It's against enforcement from litigious, crazy people out there like the Prop 65 lawsuits that, that are that are that we just now that we're out in the open, there's a target painted on us. And, and, and protecting yourself from that is, is ridiculous. I mean, and, and, and it's a really hard time right now. And, and that's as much as so, so many people in the industry feel like it's just all the lawyers trying to take their money. It's like, this, this is survival, you know? And, and it's if you're gonna survive through this incredibly difficult transition, and then I, be, I do believe that there are greener pastures on the other side once this settles. And it, if you can make it through this, I always described it as the violent J curve. You know, we are in this free fall, horrible graph, just <laughs> plummeting down. And then like a phoenix, a few will rise, you know, from the ashes who can like withstand uh, all, all these, all the demands being put upon us. So I have so many questions that I could ask. I'm not gonna ask them all. You did a really good job and I'll ask you later. But uh, one of the things uh, that really affected my company through this process, um, with all the language that came out with their direct shot of really trying to take things out of the way, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we are a technology firm and we invent processing equipment for the industry in which we license out. Do we then have to change our entire business model instead of licensing? Are we going to be required to just sell machinery outright and lose all of our rights to our IP? And then in addition to that, when uh, I came a little late, I don't know if you covered it, but the branding set mm -hmm. of this and the removal of white labelers and black mm -hmm. labelers from the industry. Uh, if you could just touch on that, like how the how it'll relate to IP and, and branding and trademarking. 
Yeah, we did we did cover that before, and I can have like an offline conversation with you about that. Uh, just, but I do think that that's one of the ones where, uh, you know, as soon as that white labeling piece dropped, I could hear like the whirring brains of attorneys everywhere being like, "We're gonna do this. We're gonna." Uh, and and part of it we were talking about is understanding the source of what they're after, and part of it is they want to know who's behind these companies, where is the money coming from, who is disclosed, who are the financial interested parties, and and bring them into the gap. So so part of the work that we're going to have to do in this comment period and, and with the agency is, is clarifying, giving them the information they need and what do they need to see about this business arrangement to make them comfortable, to know that it's happening, to know who's involved, because it does seem ridiculous that, you know, because then you go, I mean, that's what everybody's thought is, is then you go like, is the nutrient guy and the, you know, light supplier and the equipment supplier and the POS company incorporated in this. And part of that is that it's sloppy language and it's not finessed and it's not clarified enough right now to know who is truly incorporated in this. So there's no way to know if I'm going to be able to license machinery to operate or anything? I mean, I would say talk to your lawyer because, I mean, when I talk to the lawyers, they're like, it's fine. Like, well, we got this, you know, so but it but it requires uh navigation and there's no way to know in this second because these regulations aren't finalized and they're not and they're not established and so that's the clarity that has to be asked for from the agency go ahead yeah yeah julie did you notice that in uh the bcc regulations section 6425 record of sales was stricken yeah and then in the my math says in the i it says that it was going to be reinserted somewhere but he can't find it i can't find it um, that is a potential problem because it um, gave okay. instructions on consumer data yeah. that, well, one for looping and two for recalls. How are you going to reach a customer if you're not yeah. preserving that data? But really, the looping is the issue. And the, the language is it's removed from the dispensary regulations, but it's still in the delivery regulations. So do you think this is a mistake? I, I think, I mean, I've run into a couple of missing sections where I'm like, you're referencing something that doesn't exist. So I think that my guess is that, because it seems to be referring back to record keeping and that the record keeping part isn't there yet. So um, that's like where we're going to, you know, that yes, I think it'll come back. Because that was something I pointed out to them previously because there was those extensive uh, directions of what to do if it was a medicinal sale but they didn't have any record keeping requirements for an adult use sale and then they expanded it to both and then they took the whole thing out so i think they're having some you know evidently they're spitballing of like what they're there's definitely another draft coming you know and maybe i mean we're like tick tock what's going yeah they might just Yeah. So pay attention, look in the final regs. It might be in there. Yeah, because they'll be like, it was already there. You knew about it. Not, they, there was something in the emergency regs that said not doing this, this, and this. And then when it went to the regular, when they were confirmed, they, they took it out. Did they, they change for LLC which partners have to be listed between the, 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 the lease submitted to OAL and the release approved by OAL last December and didn't know by any one of those changes. There was around a dozen or so changes we ID there. So you have to watch what's actually approved by OAL at the very end. Not what's yeah. Mm -hmm. and don't change it. Don't, until you see those final regulations, don't use any versions until they get those. Yeah. Final. Yeah, and, and that's a difficult place to be as a business, to be like, don't make any decisions, order any packaging, or do anything until they come out. <laughs> but, but I would encourage you, like, please reach out to, you know, your communities, the people who you brainstorm with, me, our agency, other agencies, anybody, because this is just, it's a really trepidatious time. It's rough. This isn't even, uh, this is not even half of it, of the changes that are in there. This is all I could fit into this amount of time. There are more little beautiful uh, explosive nuggets dropped into those regulations. So, so, I mean, I implore you to please like sit down with people, have a little study group um, and go through the ones incredibly specifically that pertain exactly to your business type. Oh yeah, 
And, and we are, there is a discussion tomorrow night, uh, um, Future Cannabis Project is ho hosting like the next wave of this discussion uh, with Jackie and Pamela and hopefully me, um, we're gonna do it. And elected officials might be there so we can just continue this conversation. Cause I also think this is the way we get to solutions is by talking through this and going through the scenarios and seeing like the, all, the other impacted things that one change might trigger. So it's in Venice. Um, at the townhouse in the basement, speakeasy. It's great. It's going to be awesome. The information's on uh, Future Cannabis Project. Just could go get all the information you can get. Yes. So I know that they were, uh, they pretty much eliminated all these kind of associate people to the industry. Was there any ever talk of like a, a, like a broker's license for these? Yeah, that's one of the things that we were talking about earlier. So I think we might suggest, I don't know if they're talking about it, but, but we've talked about like there is a beer brand or a wine broker license. There's models in the liquor uh, industries, in the spirits industries for, for just having an agent card, a broker license, um, registering as a brand so that you'll give those disclosures of who you are and your background information, but you, but you, you don't necessarily, I mean, they make it sound so easy where it's like, you want to participate, go get a license. And you're like, great. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say, I'm, I'm probably going to do a whole separate piece on this later, but this is my like, uh, cause of the day. Um, the Type S license, shared facility licenses, was invented six months ago. To date, guess how many Type S licenses there are? Zero. Never happened. Um, there, is a, there is a pathway for small businesses, which is called a shared facility. There's a pathway for the Airbnb of cannabis. It's called shared facilities. Um, and, and none of it has happened. And part of it is it needs action on the local level for them to understand how to authorize it, uh, on the operational level to understand how to make your facility compliant as a type S, and as a state level where they are receptive and they're ready. They just like are like, we need the local authorization. And it was one of the dreams of like, this is how small businesses can actually get licensed in function by registering with a type S license type, which would give you a license as a shared facility participant. Um, and that's a process. We're working on building play, playbook for that to help push that through. But I do see that as an as a inroad um, to help with people getting to this pathway of licensure through shared facilities. Um, and it just isn't happening. It's crazy. I just went to look into it the other day and talked to DPH and they're like, yeah, no, there's none. Well, I'll ask you yep. Yeah, I'm sure they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we didn't talk about it here, but I know in terms of the comments, that was a, a great deal of concern people have in terms of what's being disclosed about you and where people knowing where you live. <laughs> like, um, go ahead. Uh, at this point, we've seen a lot of uh, larger companies like Lassen's and other food distributing companies pick up on CBD products. Yeah. Uh, so what what is the definition then of a cannabis product if all these CBD products are being sold everywhere? Um, th that's like a whole other thing. Um, the, the CBD market, uh, the, like the out there market is kind of a spectacular, wonderful, insane thing of none of it's okay. <laughs> like none of that's okay. It's like the greatest example of just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's all right. Um, the state is, is being very clear about those, but it is kind of like a whole separate conversation of like outside of the scope of this. Okay. Aren't we starting to see like federal laws ease off yeah. CBD? And, I don't know. Well, well, because yeah, a PDLX was legalized, but CBD wasn't. Yeah, I mean, the, anyway, I would say it gives me great concern when once uh, Big Pharma has a stated interest in controlling the CBD market, I would be quaking in my boots a little bit if I'm just like, I'm great, I'm doing CBD. So um, the portion of the Farm Act that may end up getting passed that includes uh, protection for hemp farming. Uh, and hemp production. So if, once those laws, if they go into effect, they will have conflict with state laws again, which is something we're already in the middle of. Yeah. But since they're both because of changes to the law, do you think they'll end up conflicting at all, or California will just keep doing what California does? Well, uh, I mean, California is its own world, and that is a side conversation. But I mean, I would also look into the fact that the state just issued pretty clear guidance on CBD, and the DCR just asked everybody to register for a BTRC to sell CBD. Like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, so thank you guys. We have to cut it off. Please call me. <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll have coming. All right.
Bye. Yeah.